I'm Peter Curti. I'm a research fellow in the Religion and Free Society program. And uh, this event this afternoon uh, arises from some research that I did in the uh, first part of the year, which resulted in the publication of a report looking at the impact of the uh, Gillard government's new legislation, the Australian Charities and Not-for-Profit Commission Act, and the impact that that, has, that act has had and is likely to have on the not-for-profit sector in Australia. According to a report filed by CNN on the 13th of June, America's worst charities have names similar to America's best and best known charities. These rogue charities play off the names of well-known organizations and so dupe donors into making donations and contributions amounting to millions of dollars. This is the finding of a year-long investigation into the practices of America's worst. Apparently, the 50 worst charities in America devote less than 4% of donations raised to direct cash assistance. Some charities give even less. Over a decade, one diabetes charity raised nearly $14 million and gave about $10,000 to patients. Six spent no cash at all on their cause. The only way to ensure that one's donation is not going to one of America's 50 worst charities, the report concluded, is awareness and precise knowledge of the true name and, by implication, na uh, nature and name of the charity. Well, last year here in Australia, the federal government established the Australian Charities and Not-for-Profit Commission to regulate the affairs of the nation's 600,000 or thereabouts charities and not-for-profits. The government said these reforms were designed to prevent just the kinds of fraudulent activity taking place in the United States and to which the CNN report drew attention. Public confidence in the not-for-profit sector needed to be restored, the government said. Trust needed to be shored up, and once that had been secured, it was hoped that Australians would once again donate to their favourite charities and support good works across the nation. These reforms are to be augmented by the introduction of a new statutory definition of charity once the Charities Bill 2013, currently before the Parliament, receives the royal assent. In reality, however, my fear is that these reforms amount to little more than a pretext for extending government control over the charitable sector. And this, in turn, could lead to the notion of the sector as just another arm of government. As a not-for-profit organization itself, the Center for Independent Studies, by no means on anyone's list of the nation's worst charities, or at least not on any of those CNN, for those CNN-related reasons, has a keen interest in the way that these reforms are likely to affect the work of all Australian not-for-profits. And I would add that I myself have an interest in that impact because of my work over a number of years as a minister of religion, which has afforded me considerable practical experience of leading religious not-for-profit community organizations, that is to say, local church congregations. I do understand the importance of administrative and financial accountability. And at the same time, though, I believe that accountability must be tempered by autonomy and by freedom from undue hierarchical interference, so that both staff and volunteers in local organizations can respond to local needs as they see fit. Speaking in debates in the British House of Lords during the passage of the UK's Charities Act 2006, Lord Darendorf, Ralph Darendorf, said a thriving civil society consists of a creative chaos of voluntary and essentially private activities by individuals and their associations. Darendorf argued that this creative chaos was best encouraged by a lighter regulatory approach for smaller charities and by imposing the discipline of consumer choice on larger charities which receive government funding. It's an argument that the federal government would have done well to have heeded as it devised its reform program for the Australian charitable sector. However, as the reach of government has extended yet further, the creative chaos of private and voluntary action, which lies at the heart of charitable endeavor in a healthy civil society, is, I think, in danger of being stifled. My fear is that this threatens to weaken the spirited involvement of Australians freely choosing to associate and act independently of the power of the state for the mutual benefit of others. 
Well, it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to this afternoon's roundtable discussion at the CIS, where we're going to continue to explore the evolving relationship between government and the not-for-profit sector. To help us, we're joined by three distinguished contributors. The Honourable Dr. Gary Johns was Labour member for Petrie from 1987 to 1996 and served in the Keating Ministry. After leaving government, Gary worked as a senior research fellow at the IPA and then as associate professor of public policy at the uh, Australian Catholic University's Public Policy Institute. Last year, he was appointed visiting fellow at the Queensland University of Technology Business School. He's a regular columnist with The Australian. He is the author of a number of books and is currently working on a book about the not-for-profit sector with co-author Cassandra Wilkinson. Rob McLean worked with McKinsey's for 26 years, for the last nine of which he was head of the firm's Australian New Zealand practice. He's a philanthropist, a private equity investor, company director, chair of the Nature Conservancy, and has served on the board of the CIS since 1998. And the Honourable Dyson Hayden is one of Australia's most distinguished jurists. Appointed as Professor of Law at Sydney University when he was just 30, Dyson is author of the Australian edition of Cross on Evidence and one of three authors of the Australian textbook Equity, Doctrines and Remedies. He also served with distinction on the New South Wales Supreme Court and in 2002 was appointed by John Howard, a Justice of the High Court of Australia and served on the bench of that court until earlier this year. It gives me great pleasure to welcome them to the CIS this afternoon. We'll uh, proceed with the three contributions from our speakers. Gary will speak first and then I'll hand the microphone to Dyson and then Rob will follow up at the end with some concluding remarks. Gary. Good. Well, thank, thank you, you. Uh, Peter. You'll let me know when my time is up yeah. in this forum. <laughs> uh, 15 minutes, I believe. Now, and thanks to CIS for uh, allowing this forum to take place. Okay, now, Peter mentioned the term that he didn't want charities, which is just a sub-part of civil society, to be just another arm of government. Part of my discussion today is to say it's too late. Many charities are just another arm of government. The question is, where do we go from here? My answer is not to regulate the sector, but to have an informed donor market. Now, if you are to arrive at a position where donors are to be better informed, the question is, what questions would they ask? What do they need to know? And how much does government need to be involved in setting some rules of disclosure? Because information is the very stuff of good markets. But information that's not comparable, uh, makes no sense, that is biased, uh, is the very stuff of bad markets. So uh, all markets require a certain amount of regulation for disclosure and for more powerful decisions on the part of donors. Okay, so that's my end point. Let me work through a little. I uh, was somewhat shocked when I, I started to analyse annual reports of large charities who I might say report rather well. They do disclose a great deal about what it is they're doing, although it's difficult to compare charity by charity. But for instance, Australia's oldest charity, the Benevolent Society, which this year celebrates its 200th anniversary, has an income annually of around $80 million. 80% of which comes from government by way of contract and only 4% of its income comes from donations. So in a sense this is not a charity any longer. Now in addition um, it has a, a trust fund which releases around $2 million a year and about half of those funds are used for advocacy purposes, lobbying. So 
Uh, the working title of this book that I'm writing, The Charity Ball, reflects on the fact that charities derive much of their income from government and they use some of that to lobby government. Hence, the charity ball. It goes round and round. Now, I'm not overly judging that position, but I wonder if donors were well informed about that and the closeness of the relationship, they might say, well, hang on, if government's already funding this work, why should I? That's the classic crowding out problem that you have in donations. But some, mainly economist studies, suggest there's also crowding in. Some donors actually prefer governments to be assisting because uh, if the government's giving that charity money, then I feel more confident because government presumably has performed uh, some, some homework uh, and verified uh, the charity's uh, good works and so on and so forth. So, I don't come to, to this with attitude so much as an observation that charities have a close relationship with government. And yet, we know charities from time to time and in some recent works are saying we should return to our purpose. We should do what we want to do. But when they say that, I don't hear them saying, oh, but we won't take government money any longer. So they're happy to take government money, but not necessarily government direction. Now that's a problem. It's a problem for charities. So I, uh, I, I would characterise the benevolent society, I suppose, is a, as a government subcontracted lobbyist group. And I don't mean that in a pejorative sense. This is what they do. This is what their books tell us. And they've been in the business of lobbying for a long, long time, since about 1862. So there's nothing new in that. Nevertheless, the donor might like to know what it is the Benevolent Society and many other charities are up to with the money. Now, it may not suit my purposes, for instance, who would prefer governments to let charities go about their business, to have charities lobby, but it may suit some donors' purposes. So I think the way through that, if you like, conflict of, of donor intent is to let the donor decide at the end of the day. Now, Jump forward to the regulatory position right now. Uh, the Commonwealth has established uh, an Australian Charities Not-for-Profit Commission. It's beginning now to register charities as the tax office used to. And it's beginning to ask some simple questions as they register. And there's discussion about the nature of the data. And some of it will be financial data. So maybe next year, maybe 2015, it's possible there'll be a register of tens of thousands of charities with probably comparable financial data. And it may be possible for the likes of you and I, Peter, who may be interested, to begin to compare charities' performance on financial data, their cost of fundraising and their cost of disbursements. And then the Telegraph might publish a league table that says here are some good performers and here are some bad performers. I actually don't want that to occur because I think it'd be highly misleading to suggest that one charity is not as good as another because its cost of fundraising is, is higher or its cost of disbursements is higher. What I really want to know as a donor is did they do any good? So it's the effectiveness or what seems to be more fashionable in the sector now, the impact of the charity that I'm really interested in and not its efficiency. When I buy a can of Coke, I really don't care about, uh, is it Coca-Cola, Amatil, how efficiently they run as an organisation. I just want to know that the can of the Coke is fizzy and tasty and at the right price. So similarly, that's what I want to know about whether it's the Benevolent Society or any other. And let me make clear, this is not a criticism of the Benevolent Society at all. I just choose them because, hey, they've been around 200 years and there's 
this is an interesting case study. Now, how would we be able to reach a position where donors could be better informed about the effectiveness of charity work? And I think that is, is the really interesting and juicy part of this. The Productivity Commission in 2010, when it reported on the not-for-profit sector, understood, as we do, that you cannot load up charities with an obligation to report in a very sophisticated way about their effectiveness. You couldn't ask a charity to have a cost-benefit analysis of each of its programs because it would be very expensive. So the um, Productivity Commission suggested they, they, that there should be a, a government-funded unit which might gather in all of those works that look at the effectiveness of various charities and programs that charities might be involved in. Now, that's a suggestion. I'd actually prefer a US-UK model where donors fund that sort of work. And this is the way it might occur. Right now, there are about half a dozen uh, uh, websites in Australia that list charities. And that's all they do. But the suggestion is you, the donor, doesn't know, may not know how to invest your donor dollar. And here are the charitables, here are the, the charities in which you might want to invest. Now, most donors don't ask themselves the question at large. They're not donors at large. They mainly donate to things they know. Close or because of uh, something's happened to a close relative, a friend, or they nearly drowned one year, as I did, so I give to Surf Life Saving, of course I would, or that, uh, you know, a friend or a, a, a relation has uh, had cancer and they donate to some cancer research. Most donation dollars, I think, are, are, are spoken for by life experience, but I do see an expanding market in what I'd call loose donations, donations at large, where people are searching for a cause. Now, charities are in the business of selling a cause and often selling a partic particular solution to the cause. These are people with attitude. I call them activists, and that's not a pejorative term. I was in a not-for-profit most of my life was called the Australian Labor Party. We had a view about how we would solve the problems of the world. And sometimes we got it right, sometimes we didn't. And we had to report <coughs> eventually to the voter market. Now, charities do report in fits and starts to their donors. And I understand that one big large donor can be a real pain if you're running a charity because they begin to run you. So there's a tension between the charity and what it wants to achieve and how it wants to achieve it and the donor. You can't resolve that with a set of rules. You can only resolve it with decent information. How about I'll give you a million dollars and you go away and run this program and then you negotiate between you almost a contract that says, well, we'll do it under the following circumstances, we'll take a measure at the end of uh, a year or two years or whatever, and we'll see, we'll see how we went. So it's that sort of negotiation between donor and the charity with its purpose that I think, in an iterative manner, eventually gets you to a point where the charity dollar chases the best performing charity. And I'd like to see that. The half dozen websites that currently just list charities, and only hundreds when there are tens of thousands of charities out there, haven't taken us very far. Then there's another sort of website where you can actually make an electronic donation at the website. You press a button. Now that really does prove the case that there are charity dollars loose searching for causes. And I wouldn't mind, uh, and Les Hems, I'd, I'd, I'd value your views on this, that 
uh, there, there could be a privately sponsored Australian Charities website. Now the US and UK tend to have charity raters. They award stars or points to charities as to how they perform both efficiency and effectiveness. I'd like to do it differently. I'd like to have a, a, a website that informs donors, doesn't prejudge. It says, if you're looking to make a donation, here are some questions you should ask yourself and then go searching. Now, the initial question is, what is the opportunity cost of philanthropy? You do not take money from under the bed to give to charities. That money could be better used for great social benefit by putting it in a bank. Lots of people borrow. So you'd start with that question and then you'd assay it and move down through the various questions and winnow it down until you begin to have the donor engage with some particular charities, at which time you do get into questions like, are you any good at what you do? Can I trust you? Is there a risk? Uh, what's the likelihood that you'll be successful? And, and maybe you will get into the business of um, how, efficient and if, uh, how efficient you are as well as, as how effective. And we find that discussion takes place all the time between um, philanthropists and some of the big trust companies. We won't name names, but it's a similar conversation where the prospective philanthropist comes into the office of ex-trustees and they ask the person, where do you want to spend these donor dollars? Oh, I don't know. And you begin a conversation that sort of winnows and narrows and takes the person down. Now, um, having spoken to a lot of people, undertaken some research on this, it's pretty clear that donors glaze over after a while. If you were to put an array of cost-benefit analysis analyses in front of a donor, they might just walk out the door and go fishing. So there are limits to which you can inform someone. There are limits to which someone wants to be informed. So let's not overcook this thing. I think it's uh, suffice to say you can assist a donor, you can guide a donor, but beyond that, ultimately, it's up to the donor how they how they spend their money. Let, let me round uh, off the discussion we, uh, very quickly by saying that I have a neutral position between the business sector, the government sector and the charitable sector. That is, each does good. But the charitable sector is one that I find it more difficult to prove or to know. Governments I know well and I know if they're doing well or not. Business, yes, there are, there are ways of reporting which you can find fairly quickly and assuredly whether or not they're doing well. Charity, not so much, but I do understand that we would never want to load up the charity sector so that we burn dollars. But I think we can drive donor dollars better so that the donor is better informed about how effective Australian charities are. Thanks, Peter. Thank you, Gary. Will you pass the microphone to Tyson? Yeah, you're sorry. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you, Peter, for that introduction. Peter mentioned um, <coughs> the bill presently before Parliament and raised one or two questions about its merits. I want to look at that, a small parts of that bill from a different perspective with the following background. In general, a trust cannot be valid unless either it has natural persons or corporations as its beneficiaries, uh, or it's for charitable purposes. In other words, a trust for purposes which are not charitable uh, is not valid. The reason for that approach is always said to turn on the question of control. The courts considered that there could not be trusts which didn't carry with them a mechanism for controlling of the trustee's conduct. Charitable trusts are seen as the special responsibility of the Attorney General have been for hundreds of years, so the theory is that any maladministration will be remedied by the Attorney General. Trusts for beneficiaries, on the other hand, are controllable by the beneficiaries. If the trustees don't carry out their duties, then the beneficiaries 
are pressured by their own self-interest to enlist um, the court's aid to make the trustees carry out their duties. A trust for a non-charitable purpose, on the other hand, is not seen as controllable by the Attorney General. There is one method of control which has never really um, attracted favour, and that is indirect control. If there is a trust for a non-charitable purpose, there will be present in the case of a trust created by will next of kin who will be interested if the trust is invalid and it may be in certain circumstances that they could indirectly enforce the trust but that has not been as I say something that's found favour. In our law charitable trusts have a double importance or, or for set laws they have two possible benefits which tend to conflict. Uh, in the first place they have immunity from certain strict rules of law and in the second place they confer tax advantages. The attitude of a court to a particular trust is likely, a trust claimed to be a charitable trust, is likely to be vary, to vary depending on who um, is benefiting from it. The failure of a charitable trust will inure to the benefit of the next of kin. If, if, if there's a gap in what the testator did, then the property goes back to the testator's estate. So a court which is faced with a contest between a claimed charitable purpose which the set law unquestionably wanted to benefit on the one hand and some next of kin whom the set law unquestionably did not want to benefit, a court in that position will naturally experience sympathy to be brutally realistic in favour of the charitable purpose. On the other hand, a charitable trust has tax advantages, that is be presumably because in many respects if the work done by charities were not done it would have to be done by the government. That is particularly so in relation to poverty and education. Um, I should just interrupt to say that charities are classically divided into four groups. Those for the promotion of religion, the relief of poverty, the advancement of education and a fourth class of publicly beneficial purposes which are derived from a long preamble to an Elizabethan statute in 1601. Now poverty and education obviously if not provided privately will have in some sense to be provided by the state. That is also true of much of the fourth class to do with the maintenance of bridges and that sort of thing. It's also true in part of trust for the advancement of religion because the purely religious aspects of church affairs can often be hard to distinguish from their activities in uh, achieving educational purposes and relieving poverty. Church properties can be used for preschool groups and they can be used for giving assistance to the poor and the law in effect has more or less silently um, accepted the concrete benefits that religious charities can give without inquiring beyond that. Now if there is a contest between a gift to a charitable institution and the Commissioner of Taxation, in other words the Commissioner is saying you don't satisfy the requirements of the general law for charity and you don't satisfy the requirements for the of the relevant tax act which give immunity to, to particular charities, a court will be less likely to be sympathetic to those arguing for charity, more likely to be sympathetic to the Commissioner for Taxation because if the charitable trust wins it will be a victory at the expense of the public generally because there will be a, de a decrease in the amount of tax revenue recovered. Therefore, to widen the definition of charity, whether you do it under the general law or whether you do it after this 2013 bill, will naturally result in the state having to subsidise the desires of set laws more than they do at present, more than it does at present. Now, a recognition of that tension between the interests of the next of kin in striking down charity and the interests of the Commissioner of Taxation in doing so led in the 15 years or so after the Second World War in England to the House of Lords to contract the meaning of charity. It did so under the influence of a judge named Lord Simmons. Uh, a charity must be both for the benefit of the public and must fall within one of the four classes I mentioned earlier. Lord Simmons tightened up on the definition of public benefit. He therefore struck down a gift to enclosed orders of nuns, nuns who did not participate in the ordinary work of the world. That was Gilmore and Coates. The argument for charity was that they conducted, they, they offered up intercessory prayers for the whole of mankind, but 
the court didn't accept that the benefits of that conduct was proved. In Australia, that particular decision was overturned in 2004 by the Extension of Charitable Purpose Act. Um, another of Lord Simmons's techniques was to um, tighten up the fourth class of charities to try and bring the, the disparate purposes listed there more closely in line with the original document in 1601. Another technique was a rule against political trusts. There were cases hold, there had been cases <coughs> holding that, for example, trusts which appear, appear to be trusts for education can in truth be purely for political purposes. There was the Bonner Law Trust case named after the Conservative Prime Minister of the early 1920s, which on the surface dealt with um, education about politics and history and so forth, but was construed by the court in substance to be really a political party trust. In the United States, this problem has been limited by the tax legislation itself. It, it limits tax-exempt status to charities which don't devote any substantial part of their activities to attempts to influence legislation. There's a similar regime in Canada. But until um, 2010, there was authority, at least in England and Canada and New Zealand, to the effect that a trust for the attainment of political objects, that is to say, a trust to try and change the law, was invalid. Um, that, that was so partly because the court said they were incapable of judging whether a proposed change in the law would be beneficial. Partly it was so because it was thought to be paradoxical that the law on the one hand, or that the law should treat as beneficial in the public welfare objects which were inconsistent with the existing provisions of the law. It's a rather technical point of view perhaps, but judges are appointed to administer the law and they thought it strange that they should uphold as beneficial trust designed to change the law they were supposed to be administering. That doctrine was rejected by a majority of the High Court in a case called Aid Watch and Commissioner of Taxation, a case which exemplifies one of Gary's points about the um, activist nature of some modern charities. The trust there did, did nothing to actually relieve poverty or advance education. Uh, it rather engaged simply in advocacy. It was urging the government to administer the foreign aid program better and implicit in that was the possibility of new legislation. The reasoning of the court turned on a particular aspect of the Australian Constitution. As we all know, the Constitution creates a system of representative and responsible government. Therefore, 20 years ago, the High Court detected an implied burden from, an, an implied freedom from governmental burdens on free speech. And the High Court in 2010 said that debate about legal change was part of that freedom of speech. So um, the traditional doctrine against political trust was really overturned. That freedom, of course, that, I, that they relied on had passed unnoticed between 1901 and the early 1990s. Even academic lawyers, which is a class of people who normally welcome turbulence and progress in constitutional law, thought that was really an astounding step of questionable validity for this simple reason that the Founding Fathers examined very closely the first ten amendments to the United States Constitution, the so-called Bill of Rights, the first of those amendments is a, an absolute guarantee of freedom of speech. They rejected that. They thought freedom of speech would be protected by the conventional um, squabbles and debates of Westminster politics and by federalism. Now, what happened in the Aid Watch case is an example of which there have been a number in the last 20 years of what is called constitutionalising private law. You take an idea you personally like, like free speech. It happens to be an idea which is in many direct and indirect ways protected by the general law. Another thing is, for example, the idea that judges should give reasons for their decisions. There are um, mandates, lim limited to some extent, but mandates for that in the general law. But you go further and say, these are such good ideas that we'll find that they are protected by an implied term in the Constitution. The the difficulty of that approach is something I'll return to in connection with the 2013 Act. Uh, I need only say in passing, of course, that these implied terms never seem to be stated the same way in any case. 
there, you, can, you cannot find two cases back to back in which the same language is used and it is an immense grant of judicial power at the expense really of legislative power. Aid Watch, let me conclude with it in this way, left open various questions. One is whether the free speech that is protected is debate just about the four kinds of charity, religion, poverty, education and the fourth class, or whether it's a debate about anything that is political. In other words, is it for the public benefit within the fourth class of charity that, 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 that there should be debate about any subject under the sun? Um, or should it be narrower, namely just a debate about things that you might call the political aspects of representative and responsible government backed by a mass electorate and backed by a constitution which can be changed by appeal to the electorate under section 128. A another issue not finally decided was whether gifts to political parties are charitable. After all, the operation of responsible and representative government ever since 1901, but particularly in the last, what, 70 or 80 years, has depended very heavily on the existence of political parties who, um, who debate with each other, their leaders debate with journalists, uh, all, all members of the parties really debate with journalists and with the public generally about affairs from time to time. That, the, the existence of those political parties obviously favours the public debate. In that case, why can't a gift to political parties be charitable? Now that is something that the 2000 and bill, the 2013 bill specifically rules out. Um, it does not permit a gift directly to a political party to attract charitable status. That of course may be a futile piece of legislation because if a later High Court decided that the reasoning in Aid Watch and the protection by the constitutional freedom of speech extended as far as grants to political parties, it wouldn't matter that the um, Charities Bill of 2013 or the Act of 2013 says to the contrary, legislation cannot overrule the Constitution, whether it's an express term in the Constitution or an implied term. The Commonwealth Electoral Act of 1918 restricts the funding of political parties, uh, that might be in question if that extension to Aid Watch that I just flagged as a possibility as a possibility just takes place. Now this dichotomy I mentioned at the beginning between protecting, as it were, um, the interests of the Commissioner of Taxation and advancing or not advancing the interests of the next of kin, one solution to that would be to have a narrow definition of charity for the purposes of exemption from taxation and have a, a general law definition for other purposes. To some extent, perhaps a limited one, that already happens because under the income tax legislation, an exemption for a charitable institution depends on satisfying some particular criteria over and above the general law of charity. But it's a process which perhaps could go further. Let me then just ask what is the point of the Charities Bill 2013? Why seek to enact it just before an election at a time when the government is borrowing a billion dollars a week just to pay the public service? Is it an illustration of the fact that the tendency of the Rudd government to do non-substantive things like make speeches and appoint committees and hold um, summits and so forth survived even after uh, Mr Rudd ceased to be Prime Minister? Or is it just really the production of some boffins in the Treasury or some other department it, it uh, is based on a report in 2001, which has lingered around to this time. Is it just a coincidence? There is, what does the legislation claim for itself? It really claims that it is preserving the, the common law principles by introducing a statutory framework based on those principles, but incorporating minor amendments to modernize and provide greater clarity and certainty about the meaning of charity and charitable purposes. The problem with that type of legislation is that it tends to lead to debates. Is a particular provision trying to repeat the existing law in clear terms or is it trying to change the existing law to some extent? There's a table in the explanatory memorandum which sets out the similarities and differences but it's not very precise and in that memorandum there's a paragraph which says 
that while the Act may express the common law principles using a different form of words, in order, in order to use a clearer or simpler style of expression, this is not to be taken to mean that a different idea is intended to be expressed by those different words. Now, Gary Johns, and perhaps Peter too in his introduction, raised issues which are more fundamental than those which I've raised. I think the bill is largely futile, and so far as it tries to deal with the Aid Watch case is also futile because the new constitutional term will have its life quite independently of the Act. A, a much more fundamental question is partly the one Gary raised about are charities efficient, or how do you estimate whether they're efficient, and there's an even more fundamental one, which is this. I don't myself favour changing the existing general law of charities, but uh, does it call for a close scrutiny to see whether everything within the ambit of charity is in truth for the public benefit, and therefore does it all in truth merit tax preferential treatment? Uh, thank you. Um, Gary's raised, I think, some very important um, issues for us to uh, uh, think about and, uh, and debate. I'm um, not a supporter of um, enhanced um, regulation, um, particularly with a, uh, with a government um, entity, uh, for some of the reasons that Gary's mentioned. But what I uh, have concluded uh, as a businessman having spent uh, 10 years or so involved in the, um, the not-for-profit sector um, is that the, the big question, as Gary touches on, is around impact. Um, and, uh, and that, with the, with the best will in the world, with the best brains around the table, um, if I'm out at uh, Campbelltown looking at um, Benevolent Society's program with... Um, uh, with domestic violence, um, you know, I came came away, uh, you know, feeling extraordinarily proud of the people and the work they're doing and the impact that they're having. Uh, can I measure that? Uh, can I tell um, donors uh, how well they're doing? No, I can't. Um, I can measure um, inputs like the cost of fundraising to income, um, and I can also tell you that if you take two charities, a new charity. Um, that makes its money from um, raising money for marathons, it'll have a cost of fundraising to income above 50%. If you take um, an old charity um, that uh, has a small staff and is now getting a significant amount of bequest income, it will have a cost of fundraising to income of less than 20%. Which charity is more efficient? Um, that measure, that metric tells you nothing. So uh, there's some, some things going on here that, uh, uh, and, I, and I'm pleased to see that, that, that Gary, um, you know, is I think very measured about uh, this notion of, um, you know, ha ha what to count on for in regulation. But if I step out of, um, I do feel that uh, I take issue uh, with a number of the views that Gary's expressed that he uh, uh, calls the charity ball going around, uh, handing out, uh, putting your hand out for money, um, and then lobbying against the uh, the government. And I want to talk about that uh, a bit more, and I want to talk about what I think the future is going to be. Um, that is a lot more comforting than I think uh, we've talked about um, so far. If you if you come out of the Australian environment and look at the U.S., you know, what you see in the U.S. is that the big are getting bigger. Um, the larger charities, uh, there's, uh, there's 10 that are over, um, over a billion now. And um, in areas like, um, like international aid, uh, like human services delivery, uh, they are receiving significant, and now healthcare, significant amounts of government funding. And guess what? It's the same in Australia. You know, what, what they have learned and what we've learned is that uh, not-for-profits are more efficient uh, deliverers of government services. So it's not surprising um, what, we, uh, what we see happening and what that, uh, um, that Gary describes. But I would argue um, that, and then I, and I'll touch on it a little bit later, I think we're going to see an even, and Michael Trail is, uh, is with us, 
um, with the social benefit bonds uh, that are now being uh, developed, we're going to see more and more government services uh, being turned over to not-for-profits uh, to run. Um, but where there's a metric that relates to, um, to performance. So this notion of uh, the, the big of, uh, getting bigger and uh, large uh, not-for-profits I don't think is uh, a great surprise. I think the, the, the issue to me, um, and what I'd also say with this, is that what the US has also had for 10 years now has been charity rating agencies like Charity Navigator. And... Um, uh, one of my colleagues, uh, Bill Meehan, writing in the, so in the Stanford Social Innovation Review, uh, said, look, these things are interesting. They're collecting a whole lot of data on efficiency, but they're telling us nothing about impact. Um, and, and I would say, um, am I surprised at that? No, I'm not. Do I think that will change? No, I don't. Um, so, so that problem, I think, is going to be with us. And I, so I don't just see um, the emergence of charity rating agencies, or particularly one funded um, and operated by government, um, as being, um, being the answer here. The issue that uh, we didn't touch on in the conversations previously is the issue of um, what Gary terms uh, charities standing apart from business and the state. And... Um, I'm, I'm proud that uh, CIS takes the view um, that it shouldn't and won't receive funding from government. Um, and that ensures both with our donors and anybody that there isn't any question uh, that our views are, are compromised um, in any way. But um, recently some of you may have seen uh, a program on the ABC that uh, showed Paul Moulds, the Salvation Army uh, leader, um, being highly critical of the, um, of the conditions uh, for refugees on Manus Island. Uh, what, Paul, what was also mentioned in that interview was the fact that the Salvation Army have a $75 million contract with the government um, to, to undertake that work. Um, but uh, to his credit, um, he wasn't holding back about things that he was concerned about. Um, earlier in the year, uh, Toby Hall, the CEO of Mission Australia, uh, came out and said that he felt the welfare system was absolutely broken and it needed, and it needed fixing. Now, I um, admire what Toby has had to say and I think it took courage because it basically, um, it, it wasn't um, the charity ball that Gary describes of um, uh, cozying up and asking for more money he was calling it as he saw it. And the reason I think uh, I was taken with it was that he's a person, and with mission, deeply involved in this sector. They have knowledge, I'd say, uh, second to none in terms of being able to say what's working and what isn't working. Um, so I, I don't see this um, in the way that uh, is being described here today as this um, cynical circular approach um, where not-for-profits um, get contracts, say nice things to the government um, and get larger contracts. It, it, it just isn't like that at all. But it does require uh, boards of not-for-profits um, to have values, processes and um, processes that safeguard independence um, so that that doesn't happen. In some areas, um, the notion of standing apart from... Um, uh, business or the state um, really just doesn't make a lot of sense. And if I think about my experiences with um, uh, with the Nature Conservancy, um, we um, need in a number of uh, parts of the world to, uh, in order to fulfil our mission, to work closely uh, with business and with government. And for example, Nature Conservancy has now set up um, over 50 water trusts. Um, around the world in places like uh, Ecuador and now going into North America. And they require shareholders that may be like Coca-Cola or the local brewing company, but they require uh, the involvement of government to do what happens you know, fairly simply in a place like Australia where you have a catchment area um, that the government uh, you know, sets aside to allow uh, pure and clean uh, drinking water. So it, it's, it's just there's an element of practicality about why the mission of so many not-for-profits um, requires not that they stand apart, 
uh, but they actually stand shoulder to shoulder, but do things in a way um, where their, comp their independence um, isn't compromised. Now, the, the part of what's going on with uh, uh, charitable donations and uh, um, uh, that, that I think is both exciting and the wave of the future is that um, like a lot of financial markets, there's a retail market and there's a wholesale market. And the retail market, of course, is the millions of people who make uh, relatively small donations um, and they often make them around uh, to heartfelt causes, as Gary described, things that they've been touched by, uh, you know, whether it's, uh, it, it's cancer or some kind of uh, um, experience. Um, and um, the, how we get more and better information um, to those organisations, uh, you know, to do their due diligence, I think is, is quite a challenge. And um, it takes time, um, it take, and it requires uh, effort to do so. Um, I don't see that being solved by a charity rating agencies. Um, the other market, the wholesale market, which is the, um, the high net worths, the thousand or more PAFs, um, the several hundred thousand people who now participate in workplace giving in Australia, um, that market, I, I argue, is better and better informed. And um, uh, groups like SVA, Net Balance, who do social return on investment an analysis, um, any organisation that does a social return on investment analysis, you'll read about it in their annual report. Because for the most part, when it's positive, they're very keen to share that, um, to share that with you. And why not? Um, so I, I, I feel that where we're headed with um, these, this segment that's, gr that's growing and become so important to, uh, to not-for-profits in this country, um, we have the tools, we, we are heading in a direction I think that's um, is really quite exciting and I, I'm struggling to see what the problem is. The, the third part of, uh, or the, the next part I think that's going to happen is what if you read the information memorandum of the new pin bond that um, SVA uh, so successfully uh, has raised money for, uh, for Uniting Care, um, that's, that's I think the wave of the future where investors get both a social and financial return. They look at a document that's not dissimilar to a private um, capital raising in an equity market. Uh, there's metrics around performance, and there's all the elements um, that you see, um, you know, related to accountability. Now, the latest version of, the, of one of these um, capital raisings is going to be the Benevolent Society's social benefit bond. And once we start thinking about how these play out um, uh, in Indigenous development, in aged care, in health care, um, we're going to see and be talking a lot more about... Um, uh, impact investing, and we're going to see many of the same players uh, like Mission Australia, um, Benevolent Society, uh, lined up with the support of government uh, to undertake these roles. So um, I, I come away, as I say, um, not quite sure what the problem is here that requires re re regulation and a great deal of scepticism about whether um, you know, any efforts to impose a regulator is going to be the way forward. Thank you.